Wait, where? What? Give me the box! Oh no. No, no! Not the box. This is the Escape the Zoo Podcast. With your host, Daniel Clark. Hello and welcome back. This is Daniel Clark here with the Escape the Zoo Podcast, where we talk everything wildlife with photographers, cinematographers, conservationists, and scientists. Today's guest is Dr. James Burrell, a conservation scientist and science communicator with a passion for adventurous expeditions and conservation field work. I really enjoyed this fascinating conversation, including discussions on invasive species, trophy hunting, discovering a new species of amphibian in Madagascar, using dogs that think they are goats to save cheetahs, and why we should be optimistic about conservation in general. So without further ado, here it is, my chat with the one and only Dr. James Burrell. Well, James, thanks so much for taking the time to chat. I'm a huge fan of your work, and I'm really excited to dig in because, as I think I mentioned to you in our previous conversations, most of the podcasts up until this point have really been focused on wildlife photography, and this is really our first jaunt into conservation, and it's something that I care deeply about. So thanks so much for taking the time. Yeah, sure. I wanted to to start off on kind of a positive note, because I think when you kind of dig into conservation at this day and age, that it often goes very quickly into a doom and gloom negative situation. But a lot of your work really focuses around optimism in conservation. Can you talk a little bit more about why you're optimistic given the current climate? Yeah, I guess there's two things. Um, the first one is kind of entirely selfish in that um, if I'm going to spend my life working in conservation or have a career in it, um, then the last thing I want is to spend every single day of the rest of my life doing something depressing. <laughs> so if you just focus on the negatives, then yeah, I just don't think it would be much fun. But I guess the other real reason to be optimistic is um, I think that's the only way to be because the way I kind of look at conservation now is that we're at a really interesting point. Um, we've been slowly degrading the natural world for hundreds or thousands of years, but, but the population was so small that you know, some of those impacts didn't really have a global effect. But in the last kind of 50 years, since conservation as a term has, has arrived, um, we really are having massive effects. And if we carry on the way we are for the next 50 or 100 years, then that'll kind of be it. There won't be any conservationists anymore because there won't be much to conserve. Right. So really what happens in the next 50 years, we're either going to be successful and turn things around or we're going to carry on how we have been. And I'd rather just be optimistic and put all my eggs in the basket that we're going to turn it around and do something amazing um, because the alternative is not really worth thinking about because that would just be rubbish. So I just think you've, you've got to be optimistic. And, and when you dig into it, there is so much to be optimistic about. Can you talk a little bit about specific examples of, of wildlife species that have come back from the brink of extinction and that kind of lend yes. itself to optimistic thinking? Those are just, they're kind of like the, the poster childs for, for conservation. So there's... And there's there's a surprising amount. There's there's species that have that have gone right down to really small numbers, like the Chatham Island robin, um, the Mauritius kestrel, um, all all kinds of species that uh, the southern white rhino have gone down to really small numbers. Where anyone with smart money would say that's not going to make it, mm -hmm. um, and then they've come back. Uh, you know, Californian condor, great example. But then there's also species that really have been chalked up as extinct, you know, like the Lord Howe Island stick insect, which is just this weird uh, giant insect that hid on a remote island for 80 years and no one knew it was there. Um, there was, I heard a story a little while ago about a, a, a type of uh, turtle that went extinct in Southeast Asia. And someone who happened to know a thing or two about turtles was walking through a market and they saw one for sale and they realized it hadn't gone extinct. You know, it was out what? there somewhere. That's um, crazy. And the way they the way they managed to to kind of rediscover it as it was was ask these these people selling uh, you know produce in the market if if they saw one again to take a picture on their on their phones and eventually a, a picture got back to them. No. Um, 
there's all kinds of awesome species. You know, there's a really nice website actually called lostandfound.com uh, or .org. And uh, it's, it's done by a friend of mine and it's doing an awesome job of, of telling the story of these rediscovered species. They're called Lazarus species. So I think that's kind of the, the poster child for conservation, as it were. Yeah, California condors are cool. I was actually camping in Ojai, California uh, a few weeks ago. And I saw one as we were driving through the mountains. And I think right when it saw our car, it kind of took off. They're massive, beautiful animals. But I was like, what the hell is that? And then I Googled it. And lo and behold, I think they were actually completely out of the wild at one point. I think there was like 10 left. They brought them back yep. um, and kind of got the, that, the species that was, rolling. It was actually a really controversial one because um, they were – on the massive decline and they and and sort of humans made the call to make it go extinct in the wild so they ca- they caught the last remaining individuals on a sort of last ditched breeding attempt and oh, really? you know, that that takes guts you know oh, yeah. because you can't just say hey it went extinct because of what everyone did if you catch the last you know 25 take them into captivity and then you fail it's all on you yeah. Um, so it's it, the the other example of that's the um, the vaquita, that tiny porpoise. Um, I can't remember exactly where it is, but uh, but they think there's sub fifty of those left, and they they actually bought in a strategy to try and catch them, uh, and they caught a couple and they died straight away, and oh, they rapidly no. kind of rethought. But and loads of people are like, hey, you know those guys, what idiots, blah 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 blah. But sometimes you have got to try. Sometimes you've got to lay out all the options and you've got to try and you're not always going to be successful. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because on the, on the flip side, another example is uh, the Hawaiian crow. I think they've taken and there was like 12 left in the wild and they took them all to the San Diego Zoo. And the breeding within the zoo, I believe, has been successful, but the reintroduction has been unsuccessful. So there's yeah. so many weird little factors yep. that go into figuring out how it works. But the the one example you alluded to that I heard on your TED talk, which I'm going to link in the show notes and everybody listening should definitely check out, was the Lord Howe Island stick insect. I thought yeah, this yeah. was crazy because it shows the extremes to which people can go to actually save species and kind of an ugly species at that. Um, but can you tell that story <laughs> in a little more detail? Yeah, sure. So, so there's an island called Lord Howe Island. And in the 30s, the, the, the same thing happened that has happened on loads of, of sort of oceanic islands around the world. Um, a ship was uh, uh, wrecked on it and rats escaped. And on islands where you have, you know, you know, really diverse species, all kinds of different birds, mammals, insects, and so on, often they've evolved without some of the predators that we are really familiar with on, on the mainland. So often they're things like cats, goats, or rats. And those things might kind of seem fairly harmless, but on islands, if you're totally not adapted to, you know, not, not evolved to, to tolerate rats, they can be a really big problem. They eat mm-hmm. chicks in their nests, you know, they eat everything and they reproduce really fast. So the problem on Lord Howe Island was rats got on and all kinds of things went extinct. It was a real pity. One of the things that went extinct was this iconic Lord Howe Island stick insect. And it was just known from a few specimens in a few museums around the world. And it was chalked up as extinct for about 80 years. Now, about 20 kilometers off Lord Howe Island, there's this tiny, ridiculous, just insane pinnacle that juts out the ocean called Ball's Pyramid. And it just looks like nothing on Earth could live on it. It looks so inhospitable. But a, a bunch of scientists in the early 2000s in America, they started looking at this island and thinking, hey, I wonder if, I wonder if anything could live on that. And after a lot of work and a lot of effort and a lot of uh, missed opportunities because of the weather and so on, they were mm-hmm. finally able to, to land on this island in the day. And they went up and they found this single bush and they found underneath what happened to look like stick insect droppings. I have no idea what stick insect droppings look like, but these guys, <laughs> they obviously were, were clearly right. in the know. And they actually went back at night and underneath this single bush, they found 24 Lord Howe Island stick insects, probably the entire population left on earth and they they collected four two males two females and they took them back to zoos in australia and now there's thousands of them and so it's just the most remarkable success story and one of the things i think is awesome is that 
Stick insects are pretty cool. Um, you can post their eggs and, and send them to people. Uh, they're really, really resilient. And um, you can even kind of mail order stick insects. And they've been sending them to schools around Australia and now even further afield um, so that schools can grow them, look after them and learn about this story, oh, which I think is just the coolest thing ever. Yeah. Uh, I've never seen one, but it's a life goal to one day see a Lord Howe Island stick insect. Where is Lord I, Howe Island? I've ended up talking about them a lot. So, sorry? Where is it? Um, it's just off the coast of Australia. Well, some way off the coast of Australia. What I thought was so cool about that is it, it's cool on a variety of different levels. One, the fact that I think you allude to this in the talk is that it is not a particularly cute creature. So the fact that yeah. some humans have decided that they're going to take this on as a project is really telling to kind of yeah. the altruistic purpose of conservation. Two, if you saw the photo of what the pinnacle was that they found the insects on, it's crazy to even think that you could get up there, let alone get up there and try and find insects. Yeah, you see that and you just think, no, nah, no, nah, not a chance. But how, how, the, how the stick insects got there, now that's an open mystery. And one of the, one of the best uh, thoughts I've heard was that a bird could have picked up a stick insect thinking it was a stick and, and flown over to make a nest or something uh, weird like that. But we'll, because they can't fly, you know, we'll, but we'll probably never know. Yeah, geez. But the crazy thing too is it's, it's such a powerful example of that's probably one or two people who have some strange fascination with insects, but them themselves were able to bring an entire species from the brink of extinction back yeah. to life. And it yeah. just shows and if that- you think of it, if you think of it as just a couple of people, you know, you and I, we're just a couple of people, people listening, they're just people. And if you want something bad enough and you're willing to, you know, maybe make a few sacrifices for some sick insects or something like that, then there's no reason when we hear these, these stories about species slipping to extinction that we can't step in. Yeah, and, you got to figure with a coordinated effort the things like the Amur leopard and the elephants that you hear the terrible stories about that it gives you hope that if two people can save an entire species, maybe as a coordinated society, we can help figure things out. Yeah. I wanted to dig in a little bit more about the invasive species on Lord Howe Island in general, just because it's a personal passion of mine. Because as I told you earlier, I'm working on a documentary on the overpopulation of feral cats in Hawaii and how they're predating on critically endangered seabirds in the area. What is your thought on invasive species in general? I think the really interesting thing is when it becomes cats, they're a cute, cuddly animal Fluffy. that people yeah. have a much harder time uh, getting their hands dirty versus something like a rat or a mongoose, which are kind of mean looking, uh, creatures. Yeah. What do you think about the feral cat situation in general? Cause it's such a huge problem, not only in Hawaii, but basically yeah. any Island nation and basically anywhere so, in the world. It's a shame. Um, and unfortunately the best thing we can do is wipe them out as humanely as possible. And that sucks. Um, everyone recognizes it sucks. People do it, don't like it at all, but they're getting on with the job and that's what we've got to do. They're there because we, uh, we made past mistakes. Um, but I think the, the good example, Hawaii, like to talk about, but also in Australia, there's, mm -hmm. I think there's estimates of something like three to 5 million, um, feral cats in Australia. And yeah, we can be, um, you know, soft and cuddly and, and leave them there. And if we do that, then a huge number of endemic Australian small mammals are going to go extinct. So, so that's the choice. You know, a bunch of species go extinct or suck it up and have to get rid as humanely as possible of invasive species. Um, that's just the poor decision that we've left ourselves with. Do you feel that any of the sterilization attempts have a place in those efforts? My... My view is, you know, on each, uh, each situation, on its merits, I think we have to look at the cheapest, uh, the cheapest, most effective strategy. That might be different in different places, mm -hmm. um, but look at conservation. It's not exactly flush with cash. And so I would lean towards the best outcome being whatever is cheapest and is most effective. And that should be determined not by opinion, but by you know, pilot studies and mm -hmm. scientific rigor. Yeah. And I think the difficulty 
And the unfortunate situation is it's become such a hot button debate in a lot of the areas where this is prevalent that people's identities get wrapped up in whether they're animal welfare and want to look after the cats or whether they're conservationists and want to look after all the other species that uh, the debate has become so heated that the people who could help, like the nonprofit organizations, the foundations, the politicians, are almost scared to touch it because it's just such a hot button issue that yeah. it's 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 becoming ignored and we just don't have time to ignore it because it's such a huge problem where wherever you stand, there needs to be a coordinated effort because at the end of the day, the stakes are too high. So, you know, I, I tell you what I think would help so much on this kind of thing. And so, so, so you're right. I mean, the same with um, zoos, with all, all kinds of conservation issues, things become so polarized that lots of very sensible people are scared to say anything. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't help at all. Um, my view is, if uh, the most important thing is if if you are someone with an interest in this debate or are directly involved in it or something like that, you should be able to articulate the rough arguments on both sides. And if every kind of conversation, like say media piece or interview with someone, um, could start with, so I see both sides of the argument. You know, there's it's a real shame to have to wipe out several million feral cats. Um, especially if it was via poison, because, you know, that's not as humane as sterilizing them. I totally see that. But on the other hand, X, Y, and Z is likely to go extinct in this many years if we don't do anything. Mm -hmm. My opinion is this way or that way. And I just think there's a lot less opportunity, but but people's attentions aren't quite, you know, long enough for that. They just want sound bites like kill the cats or kill the rats or... Yeah. yeah, and so I think as as consumers of of listening to these stories, especially co- as conservationists, uh, we have to give it a be a bit more discerning and 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 try and listen to the full side. Well, that's why I like podcasts as a medium in general. Is most of the podcasts that I gravitate towards are long form, hour and a half to two and a half hours, and it's the only form of media that I'm able to find that people actually go and dig into stories on more than a surface level because so much is centered around clickbait, sensationalized headlines, and trying to pump out as much content as you can in two paragraphs or less. And then the algorithm only feeds you one side of the view that you've been clicking on and listening to, that you really just don't get a sense of uh, the the details of the story in general. And I think a lot of times people lend towards what seems like the more compassionate answer, and that's not necessarily always the right answer. And if you don't even give somebody the the stage to talk about their perspective, one, you're kind of ostracizing them to a point where they don't want to see your side either because you could change their mind, but also it just, you don't do yourself justice in informing yourself properly. Yeah. It's funny. I, um, I had to mediate a, uh, a debate on trophy hunting for a, a big group of students in Oxford at the weekend. And, um, it was really good fun because I, it, it's a bunch of students doing a, just a kind of generic course. So for me to get the chance to make 400 people listen for two hours about trophy hunting, I just think is really cool. Yeah. Um, especially considering they have to see both sides. But I had to, uh, I had, there, were, there were four speakers on both sides and I had to choose a winner. Um, not necessarily which, which argument won, but the po- people that spoke best, most eloquently, strongest, most convincingly and so on. And, you know, actually one of them I, I totally disagreed with, but she spoke really, really well. And the, the people that spoke were the people that really understood the argument, tried to endear themselves to the audience, and, and got their message across. Right. Now, there was a, a couple of people who were clearly quite, quite confident, quite, quite good at it, quite experienced. And what they did was make the opposition look foolish and wrong. Mm-hmm. And they, they were allowed to interject with questions, and, and someone you know, interjected with a question. And the guy said, if you'll let me finish, you'll hear the answer to, to an applause right around the whole audience. You know, it was really entertaining. <laughs> right. But what I said at the end is I couldn't give, give that person, you know, let them win. Because if you're in a conservation situation, you know, most conservation issues aren't like a big debate in a big room like that. They're where you're sitting down with people you disagree with and you're trying to come up with a solution. If you spend that whole discussion making them look silly as best you can, then the chances of you coming to a solution that, you know, you're going to make them dislike you. And when people don't like each other, they're not going to compromise. So I think we need to be a lot 
karma, you know, not trying to get one over on each other. We all want the same thing uh, and then try and come to solution. It was just a really interesting little uh, a moment that really reminded me of, of perhaps the best ways to try and come to these solutions. Yeah, and I, I think discussing it from an objective lens is in hearing both sides of that really drives the conversation forward because it helps people find where common ground may be and at least find some ways in which they can move forward. Because otherwise you just make people feel stupid and they hate you and they don't want to talk to you at all. Um, <laughs> yeah. What about that debate in general? For listeners who aren't familiar, the idea is that trophy hunting is placing very high price tags to allow people to go into certain areas and be able to kill an animal and essentially make it a trophy. But the idea being is that if a high price point is associated with that animal, that one, it encourages local economies to focus on keeping a healthy population, but also that there might be a trickle down effect of the monies into the local areas as well. Does that make, is that a good fair? um, On on balance, um, again, unpopular, but I'm generally in favor of it doesn't mean it's something i'd ever want to do um but i take a there's a couple of things i look at the first is one of the big arguments against it is that it's ethically wrong now society kind of culture decides what's right or wrong so killing people is wrong um stealing is wrong a lot of people think shooting an animal for a trophy is wrong but there's a pretty big group of people that also think that's a a, you know a sport and a hobby so to say overarchingly that it's wrong kind of doesn't represent a big chunk of society that thinks it's okay so i whilst i think it's wrong i i can't you know i I, it's probably not right to say that everyone thinks it's wrong Mm -hmm. and as for whether it works coming back to what we talked about earlier we want to see large numbers of wild animals conserved for many, many decades, particularly in Southern and East Africa. Does trophy hunting have a role to play in that? Well, if it works as it's meant to, almost certainly. Um, And a lot of the criticisms of trophy hunting are when it doesn't have the benefits it's meant to have. So for example, um, if you, so for example, in some parks, managers have to shoot individuals, you know, to maintain gene pools in fairly small populations. So mm-hmm. if a male has sired quite a lot of offspring, you might want not, not want him dominating for the next two or three years. And so it's been a longstanding thing that game managers have to manage their populations in, in relatively small parks. Now, if instead of you doing it, someone could pay you a million pounds to do it for you under your supervision, then that just seems like a great opportunity. Um, again, not something I'd want to do, right. but if there's people out there willing to pay for it, then then great. So in principle, it has a lot of benefits, but it, it's abused. Yeah, I think, and I'm going to preface this to because I think it talks a little bit about having conversation and why dialogue is important, is I used to be very, very anti-hunting, not necessarily trophy hunting, just hunting in general. I thought as a wildlife advocate, how could you ever kill something? And then I got really into listening to Joe Rogan's podcast. I don't know if you know him, but he's he's an avid hunter. And when I started understanding a little bit more about how disconnected big agriculture and big cattle and just like the large industries around meat production is in America versus a guy who goes out and is one with nature and really understands what it means to take a life and can feed his whole family for a year and a half and doesn't need to contribute to this mass industry that's putting out terrible meat into the world, pumping more methane into the world than any other industry. I I, I got a a better understanding of it. And I was like, okay, in in some ways it's more ethical to go out and hunt, especially if it's like an introduced species, like an axis deer than it is to go and buy a pound of meat from the grocery store. And just because you don't have to have that experience of killing the animal doesn't make it any better. Um, So I, I guess in hunting, I've changed my mind, but trophy hunting, I've had a difficult time wrapping my head around because I, I, I watched trophy, the documentary, I've talked to a lot of folks about it. And I think where I, the argument loses it for me is that 
if you look at where the wildlife has done really well in Africa, like Kenya and uh, Botswana, those are the the areas that have kind of limited and don't allow hunting, period. Whereas the places that do, like South Africa and, and other parts of Africa, are the ones that are really struggling. To me, it seems like... Yeah, I think that's true in some ways. One One thing I'd say is that Botswana allowed hunting up until very recently and then banned it. Okay. And... As far as I'm aware, there's something like 13 concessions and they've managed to sell one as a photography concession. And the others are now, you know, this is around the Okavango area in the north. And the others are heading towards being converted to agriculture because, a, 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 one, you know, one of the things a lot of people say is, hey, let's, you know, let's not do hunting and let's have photographic safaris instead. Mm-hmm. And that'd be great. I mean, one way we could do that is if everyone listening here book to go on a safari, you know, increase demand. Um, but unfortunately, I think the people that want to go and hunt a trophy and the people that want to sit in the back of a car and take photos are probably two different markets. Sure. So the type of people that will do the latter, you can encourage. Um, but unfortunately, conservation is expensive. And so at the moment, I don't think we can address all of the, all of the costs with just that. I mean, if you look in, um, there's, you know, the Sulu, one of the largest parks in Africa, uh, in, in southern Tanzania. 90% of it is a hunting concession. One of the, one of the things I think um, would be an improvement, uh, one of the easy ways to be an improvement, and again, it's open to abuse, is I, I've, I've heard from quite a few people, a lot of the concessions, particularly in Zambia, they're open for three years. So let's say you're a, 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 um, a hunting operator. You know, you have clients that come out and hunt for you. Can you explain um, what a concession is real quick? Just for so a concession is like a, like a parcel of land. So okay. a, bit like a, a bit like a national park, a concession might be a, you know, a thousand square kilometers that I might lease for three years. Now, if I'm a hunting operator and I lease a piece of land for three years and in three years I have to reapply to win it again, at an unknown price, then there is no incentive for me to manage that land very well. I might as well go in, shoot anything I can find that moves and make as much money as possible because in three years, I might not have it. But if you, if I was able to, provided I met all the requirements, was audited every year, if I had it for 20 years, let's say, then it would be in my interests for the population of those animals to increase, to hunt sustainably to not shoot a male in its prime so that another male came in and wiped out all of its cubs. You know, th- there would be a lot of incentive for me to manage things a lot better. I think that's one of many ways. You know, mm. the other is that scientists do a lot of work looking at what quota should be. If you do want to take off, say, 5% of a population, how should you do it? Which individuals? What would be the least impactful way of doing it? Um, but unfortunately, a lot of that research is just ignored. Right. You know, so I, I agree that it's it's definitely not worked in some places, you know, and hunting has contributed to the decline of a lot of species. But if if it could be done following a, a pretty strict set of guidelines and people were still willing to pay and do it, then it's got it's got potential. It shouldn't be ruled out, you know, as a as a blanket ban across Africa. Yeah. And I think that is such a key component of it is one, you can't rule it out on the sake of compassion alone, because I think that's exactly what I was talking about earlier, where clearly from a compassionate standpoint, you should be like, oh no, that's terrible. Like nobody should do this, but at the very least it should be studied and understood as to what the benefits could be. I think for me, I I start to think that corruption always plays into these things. And it's almost like, does trickle down economics work? Like I almost think that if somebody were to be managing that money, how much of that money is actually being put back into conservation? How much of that money is actually going into the local communities? My guess is it's a very small percentage in most places. Um, but if there was a way to do an actual study on it where it was tightly regulated, um, and I don't even know if that's possible, but if it were, I mean, it's certainly something we should consider yeah. as an option because there is the chance that it has a benefit. I guess. I guess what I would say to... To anyone that was sort of, you know, totally opposed to it, and and this is the kind of the challenge I set myself when I when I get an opinion. I try to think to myself, what would it take for me to change my mind? Because mm-hmm. if you ever, you know, it, 
particularly conservationists, we're, as we grow up, as we educate ourselves, we develop opinions. And when you get to that point where nothing will make you change your mind, so say trophy hunting's wrong and nothing will make me change my mind, then what use am I doing talking about it, you know, and being involved in the conversation? Because I'm, I've become stubborn. And so I guess what I would say to anyone that's opposed to trophy hunting, which I totally see their perspective, and there's a lot of reasons to be opposed to it, is if if we could sh- if it could be shown in a study that you know everything was published that take an area and if it was managed under trophy hunting populations would be larger and would be maintained and those areas would be protected for trophy hunting which would improve the chances of a species surviving then would you support it and that is, at the end of the day, what a lot of scientists are trying to get at. And it's never going to be one study. It's going to be 10 studies. It's going to be 100 studies. And we're going to look at the weight of evidence. And if it all comes out that it, it just doesn't add up, then we'll be queuing up to, say, ban it. But at the moment, the weight of evidence seems to suggest there is a role for it. As a conservation scientist, do you have any interest in, is that something that you would see your work ever going into? Definitely. If, if the right opportunity came up, I mean, it's, it's something I'm really interested in. You know, um, I, I probably historically was a, a bit more opposed to it. And I spent, you know, a fair bit of time in South Africa. And, you know, when you're in South Africa, you have a braai with mates. And a, and a friend of mine invited some people around to the braai. And these guys were just hilarious, really funny, really nice guys. They bought a lot of beer. They bought a lot of meat to the barbecue. Braai, braai South African were for barbecue. And uh, it slowly kind of dawned on me as I was chatting to these guys that they were hunters. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, one side of me thought, hey, these are the guys I've got to hate. You know, I really don't like these guys. But the other side of me had a couple of beers and thought, these guys are really, really good fun. And we've got so much in common. Um, and so, again, it's different if you put a face to a name. I mean, I guess one of the things I, I hate most about trophy hunting is the posing with a dead animal. Yeah. You know, that bit, that bit just gets my go and, and going after them with a bow instead of a, a gun or something like that. But at the end of the day, if it's money for conservation and it has a net benefit, then you've got to support it. There, there's one last thing I, I'd say is um, I was in an airport a little while ago and you know, when you're in an airport waiting for a flight, you try and find something to keep yourself busy. And uh, there's always these magazine shops in the UK. It's WH Smith's, but all around the world, there's these magazine shops and you just kind of browse magazines mm-hmm. and, the often Hudson I gravitate over here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and often I gravitate to kind of the wildlife photography, conservation, these kind of things. And I saw a, an American hunting magazine. I can't remember what it was called, but it, it had a picture of a big deer on the front with a, with a kind of crosshairs, you know? And I thought, hey, let's just educate myself. Let's have a look at this. And do you know what? It was so similar to all those wildlife photography magazines. Really? Pretty much everything is the same. Beautiful photography talking about the countryside, trip reports and everything. It's just the end product is they shoot it, whereas the end product for us is we shoot it with a camera. You know, these people are really, really, really similar to us. They love the environment. They just have a kind of different perspective. So, you know, hating them is probably not going to get us a load of progress. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's an interesting debate, that's for sure. And I think at the end of the day, keeping an open mind to it is probably the most important piece of it. I, in kind of in a similar path on that trophy documentary, what is your thoughts on the John Hume debate? Which is, John Hume is this guy who uh, basically farms thousands of rhino. In where is he? He's in South Africa. South Africa. South Africa. Yeah. And the difficulty there is he does give you the understanding that he cares about his rhinos. He protects them with like military style uh, yeah. um, defense mechanisms. But the idea is that he's also harvesting rhino horn, which you can do without harming the rhinos yeah, if you sedate them. It. But the, the argument it against it, it is... Legalized. Say that again? And he's stockpiling it and waiting for it to become legalized. Yeah, to sell and it. so, but it's creating... Uh, supply for a market of rhino horn, which is kind of a bullshit uh, medicinal benefit type thing. Yeah. That's the equivalent to your fingernails. So it, it's a really interesting debate there because there's part of it where, yes, he has a healthy rhino population, but inherently by doing that, he's also increasing supply of a reason that rhinos get hunted. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts there? 
You know, it's a really tricky one. I guess what I would say about it, it's not really in the spirit of things, is it? You know, I mean, there's a kind of etiquette, isn't it? And that's not very sporting. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, it's, it's so difficult. I mean, if you look at it, has he had any poached? Nope. I mean, you know, you have that amount of money. The species is saved in a way. And ethically, from a really cold kind of scientific, kind of scientific point of view, is farming rhino any different to farming cows? You know, I know, I know rhino horn doesn't do anything, um, but there's lots of things we do and take that don't do anything. So I don't know that I feel strongly enough to kind of condemn the guy or say, I think it's fine. I'm somewhere in the gray area in the middle. I don't really know what to think about it, but yeah, it's just, it's just a tricky one. I suppose that you've got to be an optimist and look for a tiny silver lining in the shadows and think, well, Hey, at least, at least there's a large population of rhino there. Yeah. I think for me, what, what's hard for me to grasp is it almost defeats the purpose of why you want rhinos out there. And this might be altruistic and obviously, I mean, we don't live in a utopian world, but for me, like when I think of wildlife, what gets me excited is just these parcels of land that human haven't touched. And it's just this beautiful place of things living for themselves. And when you start farming an animal, it, you know that the behavior is changing. I have the same thing when it comes to like relocating animals, like be like, Oh shit. Like we lost this small population over here, but the good thing is, is we're going to take this rhino from Kenya to Sudan and all will be fine. Um, yeah. But what's unfortunate is like the more and more you deal into specific populations of animals, you almost see different behaviors, even in small subsegments of animals, like lions that climb trees, hyenas that hunt flamingos. And it's only been seen in these subsegments of population. And you know, you, you're losing that when you're relocating yeah. or you're farming or you're changing their behavior. You know, you're absolutely right. And that is that is pretty much exactly what a lot of conservation geneticists do in their job. So, so at at the broadest scale, you want to conserve ecosystems, you Mm -hmm. know, with everything in it, then you want to conserve species as many as possible. But then as soon as you're focusing on conserving a species, you want to conserve as much genetic diversity as you can. And a really kind of a good rule of thumb or a starting point is that the more geographically spaced out, a species is there's then there's likely to be different genetic diversity in those different places right yeah and so like you say if you've got three populations of lions ideally you want to conserve if possible those three populations of lions you don't kind of say well let's just conserve one of those big ones and then forget about the other two because you know to, to look at it technically what we know now just in the last 20 30 years is you lose a lot of diversity you lose a lot of genetic diversity and genetic diversity is just as important as species diversity and that genetic diversity is like a toolkit mm-hmm. so when you have things like disease come along or climate change come along the more diversity you've got it's like having a bigger toolkit you know if you've got a if you have a pipe burst at home and you've got an absolute garage full of tools then you can probably find something to fix it But as you make it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until you've just got like a little packet of a spanner and a screwdriver, whatever goes wrong, you're probably not going to have the thing you need to fix it. So the more genetic diversity you can conserve, more different populations, the better. Yeah, I've I've heard that argument too uh, when it comes to climate change is as we try and keep as much biodiversity as possible, it makes it so that if the ocean do become more acidic or if the, the... water levels rise and the, the temperature gets higher, you're just increasing your odds that what, yeah. some of these subsegments will survive. Yeah. It's, an interesting- it's no substitute, but it, it's the best we can do. It's like triage, you know? It's, it, it's just the smartest thing to do. What do you view as the largest conservation issue that societally we should be addressing right now? That's probably a loaded question, but... <laughs> um, my view is that all of the things act together. That, that's not a cop out to say there's no one most important thing, but the way I look at um, conservation is that if we had a really intact kind of global ecosystems, really low pollution levels, um, you know, no over harvesting and all these things, and then we had climate change come along for whatever reason, 
then that would be a problem. I'm sure there'd be some things that would lose out, but I think we'd see a lot of resilience. Let's say we didn't have climate change. Um, you know, we just had a massive ocean plastics problem. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there are some things that would lose out, but I think you'd, you'd find resilience. It's the fact that we've got climate change combined with so much pressure and, you know, habitat fragmentation, so much pressure on ecosystems, so much over-exploitation, all in such a short time scale. It's all of those things together that I think are, are kind of creating the, the perfect storm of a problem. Any one in isolation, I think we'd probably end up quite amazed at how resilient, you know, life is. Yeah, I. That that is one reason why I remain optimistic. And for those who have listened to several of these podcasts, they're going to hate me because I bring up this example almost every podcast. But I had a, a friend who was clearing plots of land in Western Massachusetts to build houses on, and he cleared it. He would hack away this mass amount of undergrowth and forest, creating these plots of land. And it was crazy to see how he had to do it on a weekly basis because of how quickly the the yeah. growth would come back. So I agree with you entirely that I, I think nature is resilient and that what keeps me optimistic in terms of the whole yeah. situation. But and I think that that's a, re- a really good one of bringing it back to things like the Lord Howe Island Stick and Tech, right? So mm-hmm. you you can't just... There was a a famous economist wrote some really controversial piece last year, and he said something along the lines of, let's just conserve things that are useful to us, you know, and on the surface of it, okay, if you're not into nature, that's fair enough, you know, let's just conserve cows and barley and maize and things like that. But actually, all of these things act together. You know, ecosystems have resilience because all kinds of different species are slightly redundant with each other and they all kind of fit together. Um, I don't subscribe to this whole like nature is in harmony and balance. You know, nature is red in tooth and claw, but there's a lot of kind of redundancy and resilience in the system. So when you start popping off species you don't think are useful, then initially you might not see any impact. But eventually, if you do it with enough species, you're going to hit on one that was doing something really important that you didn't know about. Right. And so you can't just pick which species to conserve, I think you've got to go at it with a principle of conserving everything. And and the way I prioritize personally is stuff that's most rare. You know, I couldn't care if it's a rhino or a tiny little frog. I think wh- whichever is most in need and you think you can help most, that's what we should be doing is triage. Can you explain what you meant there by, you said you don't view ecology is a balance but more a tooth and claw I, I, i'm butchering it but i didn't understand what you were saying yeah so one thing i never say and you you read it a lot in books and it's a really nice sort of ideology is that nature is in harmony and balance i just don't really think of it like that because every single organism is trying to survive at the expense of every other organism right you know they just want to reproduce themselves Species don't try to maintain species. Individuals try to maintain individuals. Um, I I still think that's beautiful. You know, the way it all works. Mm-hmm. It, it's led to these mad adaptations you see. You know, um, one of the things I love about nature is even if you spend your life learning about it, you can di- discover something weird you've never heard of on a daily basis. And I like all kinds of really weird niche Facebook groups. You know, I, one of the good things I think about Facebook actually is that you can like really weird niche groups and then it recommends <laughs> right. more weird niche groups to you. Yeah. And I, I like this weird gecko group. And <laughs> someone posted the other day, I can't remember the species, I have no idea where it's from, but a type of gecko that can lift its tail up and kind of squirt some horrible substance out of pores all up its tail bit like kind of looks like a scorpion when it does it and i mean you know I, if i'd ever seen something like that before i'd remember it yeah and i just think it's amazing so you've just got to conserve all these tiny weird little amazing things because you never know what they what they can do that's crazy and that that's what excites me so much about wildlife is the fact that as somebody who cares so much about it i still think i might know five to ten percent of the species that are actually <laughs> the largest population. It's like most people could probably rattle off, yeah, lions and cheetahs and 
giraffes yeah. and elephants, but <clears throat> the craziness and just how interesting each specific animal is. Something that could look so boring is like a seabird or an ant or a gecko. They, when you dig into what they're actually doing on a day-to-day basis, it's mind-blowing. Even insects, yeah. like insects that can plant these like parasitic eggs within other insects and like control their minds and help them protect their cocoons and like just weird shit that you could never even imagine exists, especially in something that you seemingly deem to have very little intelligence from a uh, consciousness standpoint. Yeah, uh, it's just, it's a, just it's a bottomless pit. And and that's the great thing kind of working in it because you just get surprised every day. You know, on the big expedition in Madagascar, on the, on the last day, we were packing up camp. And just as we were packing up, the, the last thing I saw in that forest was there was this gigantic wasp and it was attacking a, a tiny tarantula. And we hadn't actually seen a tarantula on the, on the whole expedition. And it's one of these ones that, that stuns it and then lays its eggs in it and buries it in a hole. And when the young hatch, they kind of consume the poor thing. Uh, and, you know, you, yeah, just coolest, coolest stuff. It's crazy. It's crazy. The documentary I'm working on now is all about Toxoplasma gondii. It's essentially this parasite that the only place in the entire world that it can sexually reproduce is in the gut of a cat. And so what happens is the cat sheds the the eggs of the parasite in its feces. And then if it gets picked up by a cat because it's like drinking a water source that's contaminated or it's rooting in the soil, then great. It continues to reproduce and create more. But if it's picked up by rat prey, I mean by cat prey, like a rat or a bird, it migrates to the area of those animals most likely to be predated on by a cat, like the heart or the nervous system. And they still don't know exactly how, but somehow it rewires the brain, whereas you put a rat into an enclosure with cat And makes them like the smell of it. Yeah, whereas like innately they would hate it just because traditionally, instinctually, they're trying to stay away from it. It's just bizarre. They're actually sexually, slightly sexually attracted to the smell of cat piss. (laughs) <laughs> just makes them more likely to be predated on. But that's crazy. I mean, that's tens of millions of years of evolution yeah. in the making. Life and, is so cool. Yeah. But back to Madagascar, you actually found a new species in Madagascar, right? Yeah. Well, I've got to give all credit here to, um, you know, one of the guys I worked with, a guy called Mark Schertz. And he is just kind of one of the best taxonomists on earth right now, I guess. And, he he was the one that really, you know, he was just sitting there getting excited at every single thing we bought in. We'd go <laughs> out on surveys. And it's kind of like going shopping. Like people think, I don't know what people think science is like, but we basically had little bags and we're going along these transects looking for stuff. And if it's something new, we're kind of like, I'm just going to borrow you for a minute, stick it in a bag, <laughs> take it back to camp. And, 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 you know, he'd examine and have a look at them. And, uh, yeah, I, you know, I think it's going to turn out there's several new species actually, but we've got one published and named after the expedition, which is, which is just kind of one of the things you always aspire to, to have. So all, all credit for Mark for his, you know, really hard work, just chugging away through all those samples. Yeah. That's amazing. Are the amphibians in Madagascar having similar issues to the ones in South America with that fungus that's spreading and yeah, no, that's a, that's a really tricky question. Um, not sure is the answer. Um, there have been some studies that have picked up chytrid fungus, mm-hmm. but a lot of people have also cast pretty big doubt on that. And the last thing I heard was that it could be that chytrid originated in Madagascar and they have some immunity. But uh, I'm not. I'm not kind of up to date with the latest thinking. And, <laughs> and some of my colleagues would probably be, have pretty strong opinions either way. So I, I'm not sure. But it's it's something that people are really worried about and actively working on. There's also an, an invasive species there, actually. There's cane toads, you know? And so we had these ID sheets of all the species we were looking for. And what you were talking about with cats and rats, cane toads are poisonous and a really big problem. Mm-hmm. And our basic plan was, if you find one, kill it. Yeah. Which just sucks because you, you're going there because you just love life and wildlife. And a cane toad's no different from these other awesome animals, but it's just we know what impact they can have. And, you know, fortunately, and I, you know, I say fortunately, we didn't find one. And so I didn't have to kill one. But 
I kind of see it as my duty that I can't preach that we should be really hard and do stuff, particularly on invasive species, if I couldn't do it myself. Yeah, well, I mean, and in a weird way, it's almost just not doing one act that in turn, by not killing that cane toad or by not killing that cat that might be predating on birds up in the mountains of Kauai, you're in turn killing dozens of other animals that are yeah, struggling exactly. because of that. It's just the act itself that can be brutal. Yeah. Kitchard fungus, that's an, I, I couldn't think of it when we were talking earlier. I read The Sixth Extinction by, um, I'm blanking, Colbert, I think it might be. Anyways, I'll, I'll link it in the show notes. But uh, when I was reading that, I had no idea that Kitchard fungus was essentially wiping out like 80% of the amphibian populations in the world. And when I was I'm pulling that number out of my ass, so please correct me if I'm wrong. But when I was reading that book, I was like, what the hell? We need to figure this out now. Is that something that's still as big a problem as when that book was written? And are there mitigations that are helping? Yeah, as far as I know, it's a it's still a pretty serious problem. It's still the topic of um, a lot of study. There's, there's another disease that I've also heard about more recently called ranavirus, which is, also seems to be a threat in some parts of the world. Um, South America appears to be worst hit. I mean, the golden toad and Darwin's frog, uh, two that I think have gone because of it. Mm -hmm. Um, certainly other species. Um, I think one of the things about a lot of these issues, like, you know, take plastics or chytrid is sometimes there'll be some big breakthrough and you'll hear about it in the news, but it's really easy to think, Hey, why isn't someone doing something about this? And Really, there are so many people working so hard on so many of these things. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I guess problems are hard. Conservation is really hard. And so it can take years to suss something out. I think one of the things about conservation is, let's say you think you found something. You think you found a, a solution. Mm -hmm. What if you're wrong? You know, what if what you do makes it worse? And so I think in conservation, there's and science in general, there's just this really sense of, you know, you've got to get it right because you're, you're messing around with real life. And so you can't just rush in. So, uh, you know, with Kitra, certainly there's hundreds of research groups working really hard to suss it out. Yeah. That's a heavy responsibility, man. Have you ever, have you come across that where you're, you're feeling like you're onto something, but it's just, I mean, the weight of actually implementing <laughs> it must be terrifying. Yeah. Well, Yeah. N never something as profound as like a cure to chytrid, but you do th you do get carried away with your own research and you get wrapped up in it and you think, oh, this is awesome, this is awesome. And you think, oh, you know, what if I'm wrong? Like I, I go around saying I, I, I generally support GM crops. I generally think trophy hunting is something we should accept. Um, I go around saying a lot of stuff and I could be totally wrong. And I, I like to think that if I... If, if there was better evidence, if there was evidence I was wrong, then I'd be the first to admit it and say, ah, everything I said was wrong, just, you know, ignore that rubbish. But you've just got to do the best with the knowledge you have. Yeah, well, I think if anything from the trophy hunting debate, whether right or wrong, at the end of the day, having somebody with your background advocating that it is a potential solution, at least gets people to be like, oh, maybe I should at least think about this. That's, that is all I want. That is all I want. Just have a look. You know, read more than a headline, make up your own mind. If you still disagree, awesome. That's fine. You know. What is, uh, what are you working on right now? What's the main focus? What I'm working on right now is it's a good example of how to kind of get at conservation. Sometimes you have to go this really kind of circuitous route, kind mm -hmm. of all the way around the houses and so on. So I work on a crop in Ethiopia called NSET, and it's really, really weird. I'd never heard of it this time a year ago before I started. And if, if everyone pictures a banana, picture, picture a banana tree, mm -hmm. um, NSET looks really like that. And it produces these little kind of yellowy orange bananas as well, except they're full of seeds and they're not really very good to eat. And instead, what you eat is the kind of trunk and like the underground root part of the NSET plant. And to give you an idea about how big these things can get, they can be over a meter across and 10 meters high. Wow. And so that's as big as a house. Yeah, that's yeah? huge. It, it's so big that it takes two people to put your arms around it and as big as a house. And people grow fields of this stuff in, in southwest Ethiopia. And the place where it's, it's grown, 20 million people are living off it. So 
that's like a third of the population of the UK. So that's like a major, major, major crop. But because it's only grown in this really one tiny bit of Ethiopia with a really high population density, uh, and it's traditionally been really quite isolated, no one's ever heard of it, and very little research, kind of agricultural research, has taken place. So we're looking kind of at everything to do with NSEC because it's potentially this, this amazing food security drought tolerant crop, um, which is, some, is something so valuable in a place like Ethiopia. Now, what is that, you know, so I've ended up spending the last like year just like chatting to farmers, you know, in, in these hills in Ethiopia. And what's that got to do with conservation? Well, if you can have these amazing food security crops, then all of a sudden your reliance on, on the tiny bits of forest that are remaining in Ethiopia decreases. Right. You know, it, the, the, the problem is, you know, Ethiopia's got over 100 million people. It's the second most populous country in Africa. I had, I had no idea of that. Neither did I. And, and let's say you, you, you grow cereals, you grow, you know, normal conventional crops that we're familiar with. You, you plant them in the spring, you harvest them in the autumn, and something goes wrong. You get a disease, you don't get your rains, something goes wrong. You're screwed. All of a sudden, you're screwed. And so perhaps you, you go into the forest and you harvest bushmeat or you start harvesting wild plants or you've got to do something because you're going to survive. The cool thing about NSET is that you plant it and you can harvest it at anything from about two to 10 years old. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It can, it's really, really resilient. It can survive all these little changes in weather. Um, it can survive periods without water. And so the way we kind of picture NSET is like an insurance policy. So maybe mm -hmm. you've got your other crops, but you might have 10 of these things at the bottom of your farm. And if everything goes wrong with your other crops, that will keep you going for several months. And you don't have to suddenly resort to, to different things like converting forests so you can grow cash crops or something like that. And what do you make out and of so, it? So you make some weird stuff. The three main foods are called cocho, bulla, and amicho. Amicho is when you just boil it, kind of like a potato. I haven't tried that one. It's, it's, not, it's not particularly common. Um, cocho and bulla, you basically mash up this big trunk. You, you scrape it, you bash it, you turn it into a pulp. And then you squeeze that pulp and the liquid that comes off is kind of like pure starch. And that's bulla. And you can make a really tasty kind of couscous type thing out of it. Um, but you can also make a kind of not so tasty paste with butter and stuff. But Got it. Ethiopians love it. I mean, I've just not acquired the taste for it. <laughs> and then the other food is cocho, which is kind of like bread. Bread is probably being a little bit optimistic. It's um, it's kind of like a slightly cheesy cardboard, but again, you know, if you have it every day, you actually get used to it, and it's it's pretty nice. So, I think there's a lot of opportunity in the future for kind of like nutrition experts to come in and see what else we can make with this stuff. Right. But as a crop, it's just mind blowing. You know, ten meter high, and you have fields of this stuff. It's like a miniature forest. It's interesting to think from your perspective as to how it's it's seemingly a little less related to conservation, but arguably more important than some of the other things you could have taken on. Yeah, I guess you just have to think For of it in terms result. of yeah, you just have to think in terms of priorities. So, if you go to a place like Ethiopia and you say, you know, and, and my guys laugh at me because I do all this farm stuff, but I'm always walking around with a pair of binoculars. You know, and I could <laughs> right. be kind of talking to someone, but if I see a bird I haven't seen, I'm, <laughs> I'm away with the fairy. Yeah. And, you know, I've on sometimes I take a day off and I go to a bit of forest and the guys come and walk around with me and they think I'm a bit weird. And, you know, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, I'm looking at your birds. They're amazing. You know, <laughs> and I say, crikey, this forest is amazing. You know, what are we doing to protect it? And when your priority is feeding your family, you really just don't have time to think about conservation or why you should conserve forests. Now, there's really good arguments like it helps regulate water supplies and, and people are seeing things like that. Like having forests is really important. Yeah. But on a kind of really small, like what am I going to do this week or this month to feed my family? It's just not as important as growing stuff. And so I think because we have different values in the UK, you know, in Europe and the West, because we've, we've had a, a few more years of development, 
um, we automatically think everyone might have the same values. And I, I'm as guilty as of that. I, you know, how can you not think this bit of forest is awesome? But when you think about it, how they're thinking about it, actually the, the route to conservation is, is quite different. The, the, one of the best things that Ethiopia has done is Ethiopia is the home of coffee. So mm. anyone out there that's sipping a coffee on their way to work, listen to this. Coffee came from Ethiopia. You know, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> and the diversity, like we were talking about genetic diversity earlier, diversity of coffee and the flavors in Ethiopia are just amazing. There's lots of really hip barista type people in London who just worship Ethiopian coffee. And you know what they did? They realized how valuable coffee is and they conserved this huge, you know, 20,000 hectare chunk of uh, Yayu forest in the far west as a reserve just to protect coffee diversity. Wow. Not for any of the awesome species that you and I get excited about, not for the mammals, not for the birds, not for the trees. They conserved it because coffee is Ethiopia's major export. Conserving that bit of forest is just sensible. And they did it. Well, I'll be honest with you. There's something I care about more than wildlife it may be coffee I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so, I, so that makes a lot of coffee. sense to me and ethiopian coffee in general is ridiculously tasty i mean again like there's so many different varieties of it that it depends on the one but i i personally am obsessed yeah it's i i'm totally with you again major perk of the job but I, know, they also have a drink called spree's out there which is tea and coffee mixed together sounds weird but Try it. Spreece? How do you spell that? Spreece. I, I have no idea how to spell it. <laughs> I'll check it's it out. like 80%, 80% sweet tea, 20% coffee. It, believe me, this could be the next big thing. That could be like the million dollar <laughs> idea. Maybe I'll go start that business. Because <laughs> Lord knows I'm not getting making that on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I think what you're hitting on there too, which uh, w- was so important is that you can't take a Western mentality into solving uh, Eastern problems or African problems. And I think it goes the same way. You can't take an African mentality to solve Western problems. You just really need to understand that there's so many factors on a grassroots level in certain areas that matter. I mean, I always thought like, who could kill an elephant? Who would poach an elephant? That's such a horrible thing to do. But like, if I'm honest with myself, if I was struggling to put food on the table to feed my family and lived nearby and knew that I could make some money off of doing that. And I would hope that I wouldn't, but I would hope I could find other solutions, but I can understand the pressures that people are under. I think the problem is, is that we need to find systematic changes to actually address those things instead of persecuting people that are just kind of hoping that altruism will play through because yeah. altruism is a is a value or a benefit that not everybody in the world has the ability to to focus on um yeah so it, that's it's, a, that's it's a, i mean that that reminds me of one of the other things that really gets my goat and that's you know when you see these articles like um ah uh, you know five poachers killed you know and everyone's like ah oh, fantastic you know that's the elephant's revenge you know right the, the poachers are probably the poor guys from the village that needed to make some money. You know, if there's people you want to dislike, it's the people organizing systematic wide scale exportation of ivory or rhino horn or things like that. But it's almost never like the guy. Yeah. They're not going and doing it. You know, that might, there might be an exception to that in places like, you know, Kenya or South Africa where you do have kind of pretty organized gangs doing stuff because Mm -hmm. there's high security, but poaching in, it happens all around the world. You know, in in South America, in the Amazon, you know, I I worked with a guy, and he told me over a campfire one night how he'd gone out and shot jaguar, you know, and this was this was twenty twenty five years ago now, and he had no idea. I mean, he just lived in a village, and there were jaguar everywhere, and he could make some money, and so he shot some, and he didn't feel bad about it. But then ten years later, when um, some conservation NGOs started working in the area, and he could get a job doing that that's even better. So he just did that instead. And I think there's, so I think there's a really big mix up between what poaching is and what hunting is. Poaching is what we call it when we don't like it. And hunting is just what most people are doing. Um, so yeah, that's just a, it's a, it's a slightly tricky one. with the Yeah. And, and the sad thing is the guys who are putting themselves at risk and doing that. And again, I'm not condoning it, but 
they're getting pennies on the dollar compared yeah. to people who yeah. are organizing it. They're like getting enough. They're not going to get one elephant and then kick back with. Yeah. You know, like you hear like, pounds. Oh, like one tusk can be worth $40,000 or something like that. Yeah. Well, they're not seeing 40 grand from that. They're yeah. probably getting they're probably like, seeing $40. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. Um, yeah. Wait, I, I totally blanked. What were we just talking about on the, um, I don't know. I keep, I keep, Making you jump around. (laughs) No, I had so many different things. I had a parallel that, oh, that's what it was. Um, We were talking about the Jaguar. Um, Do you know who Sean Heinrichs is? No, you'll have to educate me. uh, He's in the documentary Racing Extinction. He was on the podcast. Ah, I am obsessed with his approach to conservation because he's so thoughtful uh, in terms of, I think the best example is in Racing Extinction, they're in this fishing village in Indonesia. And historically, they had always hunted, I don't know, five to 10 manta rays a day or something like that. And that fed their village. And they'd been doing that for hundreds of years. But long story short, um, other Eastern influence and big industry came in. And all of a sudden, they gave them better techniques and better equipment. And they were getting 100 a day or something to that effect. And Sean went in with another uh, conservationist, Paul Hilton. And they were talking about the story. And I remember thinking, one, just how insurmountable the problem seemed, but also two, how I empathized a lot with the village themselves because, I mean, it's their way of life. They've been doing it for hundreds of years. You can't just go in and say, hey, stop doing that because we're going to turn. But long story short, they really got people excited about thinking through an alternative means of, one, pushing people towards sustainable fishing, two, bringing a lot of research into the area, and three, bringing a lot of ecotourism into the area. Then now, the manta rays have skyrocketed since then. I don't remember the exact number, but it's an insane number. And uh, the, the village is doing better than it's ever done. So I think the, the key is, is that all conservation are complex issues that are seemingly not what they look like from the outside looking in, but there are ways to address them. You, you're absolutely right. I've, I've had so many moments where you kind of got a plan, like maybe you know about something and you've got a plan, you're going to go on expedition, you're going to try and address it and you get there and just everything is just so much more complicated than you thought. And you just have like a moment of like, I literally cannot see any feasible way to make any progress whatsoever. And you know what? Just sleep on it, you know, have a coffee, go for a beer, sleep on it. And, and something will something good will come of it in the end. You just have to sometimes think outside the box. This is a very specific question, so I'm not sure if you'll know too many details about it, but uh, do you know a Coyote Peterson? He's a big... No, he's he's a huge... um, He's like the Steve Irwin of the YouTube generation. Uh, (laughs) So, But I saw him speak at a conference in Los Angeles uh, a few weeks back, and he was talking about how he went to South Africa to do a story on rhinos, and they ended up spending a lot of time filming, but didn't end up releasing it because the situation with rhinos in South Africa is so convoluted and confusing and frustrating that they didn't even know where to begin. And I had another conversation with a wildlife cinematographer who was saying the same thing, that it's just a totally messed up situation about the rhinos in South Africa. Do you know what that's about? Because I know it's people have been talking about how messed up it is, but I don't actually know what's going on. Well... I actually, I actually recorded a bit of podcast on rhinos in South Africa last year. Okay. And I kind of, I kind of, I never put, finished putting it together. Um, it is, it is confusing. I think, yeah, I don't think we know. I don't think we know what behind it. I, I think what gets me on things like the rhino thing is when you, there, there was a guy on the reserve that I was on. Mm-hmm. And I think I think there's two kinds of people that know things about rhino stuff. There's people that aren't involved at all and kind of looking at the big picture and sometimes somewhat have somewhat an impartial view. And all of us not lucky enough to live in Southern Africa probably are in kind of that group. And then there's the people on the ground that kind of have the real experience. And I sort of certainly don't consider myself to have very much of that. And I, I think of it very much big picture, like I do with all conservation. Sure. And standing in the bush one night, you know, with a beer. And this guy just said to me, we're just waiting, you know? We're just waiting to hear a chopper or we're waiting to hear a gunshot. 
and then we'll go out and we'll find one of our rhino dead. And you know, you hear these things like you don't think it could happen to you until it does. And I guess I just, I'd seen rhino before, but it, it hadn't ever been real to me. And I'd seen the rhino on the reserve that day. And just for them to say, they are literally just waiting. And they said, you know, there's a park to the west of them. It's been hit. There's a park to the east. It's been hit. There's a park to the south and to the north. They've all been hit. They haven't yet. And so they're just waiting. Do you know? And it, it's one of those things that had never actually got to me until, until they said that. And then I just kind of got it, you know? And so I can't, you know, kind of shed any more light on it than that, really. But, it, it, you know, the more experience you can get, it just gives you different perspectives. And is it, is it strictly poaching? Is that what it is? Or is it? Yeah. Is there other dynamics yeah. going on there? No, I mean, people want horn. Yeah. You know, and, and with like a lot of these commodities, the rarer it gets, the more the value goes up. So it's, it, I guess it's kind of simple dynamics like that in many ways. Yeah, it was just the, the way they were phrasing it, it sounded so strangely vague, but I guess. Um, I think there's a, a hell of a lot of corruption involved. Yeah. And that always makes things nice and complicated. Yeah. But anyways, I want to talk a little bit about your work in Madagascar because that seemed to be a, a very large piece of what you've been up to for the last few years. Can you talk a little bit of, I always think Madagascar in general is just an amazing place that I really want to visit because what I didn't realize is that it's like three times the size of the UK. Um, yeah. It's a massive place and the biodiversity there is absolutely insane. And ever since I watched uh, Anthony Bourdain's Parts Unknown in Madagascar. I've always really, really wanted to go, and it's an awesome episode, which I'll link in the show notes. But uh, can you talk a little bit about what draw you, drew you to Madagascar and what you were working on there? Yeah, so so Madagascar was the first place I went. You know, as a 17-year-old, the first big trip I did, and I just thought, oh, this is going to be awesome. And I guess I pretty quickly realized how tough everything is in conservation you know Mm -hmm. um we were working in this little piece of forest and it was awesome and there was so much life and there were you know there were lemurs there were chameleons there were amphibians it was just amazing and on like the third day i climbed up this slope and i could see four times as far in in the other direction and it was just grassland you know and then a couple of weeks later we we drove for two days down south to another national park and we didn't pass a single piece of forest on the way. And I just, I guess what, what drew me to Madagascar is that that gave me direction in my life. It wasn't some like massive epiphany or anything like that, but I just mm-hmm. thought, I want to do something useful. Madagascar's got loads of problems. I don't have any of the solutions yet, but if I work really hard, maybe one day I'll have a really small solution to help. And that just seems to be a good way to spend your life. And so... In many ways, I've worked in lots of places now, but Madagascar gave me direction to do it. And I love what I do and I'm just a very happy person. So I guess I owe a lot to Madagascar. Um, And so I'd like to try and give something back eventually. If you could, if you had unlimited funds to basically work on any project that you wanted to, that you think would immediately have the most impact or would be the most interesting to you or what you would really want to dedicate your life to? Do you have a sense of what that project would be? No, because, you know, there's lots of examples of lots of money. I mean, Madagascar is a good example. People have been putting money into it for 30 years. And yes, no lemurs have gone extinct, but there's really... You know, this isn't a criticism in any way, but there really isn't an awful lot of progress. Yeah. You know, we're still kind of in the same place we are. Um, I'd love to be able to reel off my head what I'd do with a hundred million, um, but I just think it's it's as and that's a great example of why conservation is so tricky. I think I'd just start dishing it out to as many places as possible. You know, I think lots of small amounts of money, small grants for people to get lead their own expeditions, get people inspired. I think that's probably what I'd do, but. It's so tricky. Back on the the optimistic approach to conservation, I saw last year 
that you went on a trip through Eastern and South Africa, specifically highlighting really successful conservation stories. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about what inspired that trip and some of the more memorable experiences from it? Yeah, well, I guess, um, so I just spent four years doing a, a PhD. And if you work too hard, I think you're in danger of losing the passion for why you love wildlife in the first place. So a big, big part of it was to, to get out there and, and see all the things I, I love. Um, one of the, one of the projects that really stuck with me was just so simple. I have two of them actually, it's just so simple. One was, um, cheetahs in Namibia. Now cheetahs, a lot of people talk about rhinos. A lot of people talk about elephants. There's something like uh, 20,000 white rhino. There's about 7,000 cheetah left, less than half the number. Cheetah are really having a bit of a tricky time. And um, Namibia is actually home to pretty much the largest population in southern East Africa. So Namibia is kind of the, 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 the center of cheetah conservation. And one of the big problems with cats and predators in the wild is when you're a herder and you have goats or something like that you don't like cats because they eat stuff or they scare your goats and things like that mm -hmm. and there's a really simple project that has started breeding these enormous dogs and they are completely cute and sweet and friendly wouldn't <laughs> hurt a fly but they have the most fantastic bark and they look really quite scary and they're, they're Anatolian uh, shepherd dogs from Turkey. And what they've done is they take the puppies and they grow up with their mum for a little bit. And then they put them with the goats. And this puppy grows up thinking it's a goat. Completely <laughs> thinks it's a goat. Right? It sounds ridiculous, but it completely thinks it's a goat. And it thinks the goats are part of the pack. You know, the goats are its bros. And it lives the rest of its life like that. It goes out with the goats in the day. And I mean, it probably gets a bit bored. They're eating, but it just sleeps <laughs> under a tree. Then at night it comes back and the farmer feeds it. So the farmer has to, you know, a little bit of money for food. That's all the farmer has to do. But if a cheetah comes along, hey, dog goes nuts, starts barking. And the cheetah, it doesn't get injured. It doesn't get attacked. The cheetah thinks this really isn't worth my time. Mm -hmm. This just seems like a whole load of hassle you know, it really isn't worth a fuss. And the cheetah wanders off and goes to hunt something wild. And do you know what? It has been so, so, so effective. Simple. That's crazy. Yeah. And you just think, oh, wish I'd thought of that, you know? And so they are working really hard, um, Cheetah Conservation Fund, to, to breed these dogs. They give them to farmers that, that will look after them. You know, if the farmers start neglecting the dogs or treating them badly, then the dog gets taken away. But they're, they're ramping it up and lots of other people are starting to look at this, you know, and it, and it has the same effect. It keeps leopards away, keeps other things away. And it starts making people feel less, you know, hateful towards the cheetah and the leopards and things like that. I think that's a great Simple. example of uh, what you're saying about money not necessarily being the primary factor to a lot of these things too, if anything. Sometimes it might be able to stop some of your creative solutions that might be the most powerful. I mean, it, it, yeah. I could imagine if you dumped a hundred million dollars into that project, all of a sudden crazy fences were going up yeah. and new systems yeah. were going in. Whereas it was as simple as breeding a goofy dog that thinks it's a goat. Yeah, <laughs> um, exactly. I heard a really cool one recently too about a, a huge problem is the elephants going in and stomping on farmland that, um, locals are, are growing and obviously that's their sustainability and their their income so it's easy to think of why they start thinking of elephants as pests and want to kill the elephants and take the bush meat but really just get them away from their crops and fencing one can be really expensive but also if you think of the size of an elephant if it really wants to get through a fence it probably could <laughs> yeah. so what they've made is have you heard of bee fences oh i've heard of, i didn't know if you were going to say bee fences or chili bombs Oh, so I haven't I've heard, heard of chili bombs. Yeah, I've I've heard of bee fences, but another one is they make um they take like elephant dung, something else, and ground up chili powder, and they turn it into these like smoking bricks, you know. And if the elephants come, you set fire to these things. They smolder, lots of smoke, smells horrible. Elephants go away. Really, cool. Yeah, yeah. I guess. <laughs> Maybe a combination of the two would be absolutely ace. <laughs> yeah, well, for, for listeners, the, a bee fence is essentially they string these hives of, of bees and for some reason elephants are terrified of bees to the point where even if they hear the sound of bees, 
that they have a distinct call or communication that they've been able to say that's like the elephant word for bees and they just stay the hell away. So it's incredibly inexpensive to keep them away. But I just think that type of stuff is so fascinating and so immediately implementable that uh, that's what gets me really juiced up. Yeah. Yeah. See, you just never know where an idea is going to come from. And uh, so that's why I think the more people we have doing conservation, working in conservation, the more weird and wacky ideas we're going to get that are going to make a difference. What would you say to the argument of folks that climate change is going to get all the animals anyway? So what's the point? Oh, uh, well, I mean, if you want to be a loser, <laughs> you know, if you want to just, I mean, maybe, but wouldn't you rather give it a shot? Doesn't everyone like a film where there's an underdog? You know, I mean, you can sit back and just give up, but uh, it, it's just not how most people are built, I think. Yeah, I agree. And I don't agree with that question that I asked at all. I just wanted to hear your answer because that's a really <laughs> shitty question and not something we should be focused on. Uh, <laughs> I want to, I know we're getting a little closer here, but end on a few rapid fire questions. Uh, if there was a book that you could rep- recommend uh, that has to do with wildlife conservation, what would that be? Yeah, uh, Wild Hope by Andrew Bumford. Seven beautiful conservation success stories. Love it. Awesome. How about a documentary? Um, I really liked End of the Line. A little bit, little bit old now, but overfishing. Um, that one, that one got me. And 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 for a series. I actually really enjoyed Human Planet, BBC series, which, you know, I know it's about humans, but I thought that was probably one of the best produced documentary series. If an average individual wants to help out, one, just how can they in general, and two, financially, if they wanted to, how do you decipher between all the organizations that you could donate to and decide yeah. where your money is is most well donated? Sure. So... I'd say there's two things there. What can they do? So I've spent the vast majority of my life being a student. So look, I've mostly been asking for money from people to do conservation stuff. So where to give it hasn't been on the top. So I I empathize with a lot of people that want to help, but maybe don't have much money. And so Mm -hmm. what I would say to them is be a discerning consumer of media. And what I mean by that is, What we really need is conservation stories to be on the front page of newspapers, for example, as opposed to boring celebrity stories. Now, the way that happens, whether you like the system or not, or whether you want to complain about how the world works, the way to make that happen is to click on those stories and to have more people click on those stories than to click on the boring, useless ones that don't matter. So when you go online, read the conservation stories, read them from good sources, you know, maybe leave your browser open to rack up the minutes of viewing time or click on them several times to help help us all out, you know. Uh, but just be a, a, cons- a discerning consumer of media. Don't click on the, the silly clickbait ones. Click on the good stuff that matters. And that will make it more important. And that will raise its profile and it'll be a snowball effect with a bit of luck. Yeah. I, so that's what I would say to that. I read a, an article yesterday that was a little concerning talking about how so little news coverage is is touching climate change now because people have kind of I don't know if apathy is the the right word, but have kind of developed a distaste. Yeah, I know for I think it. apathy is the right word. Yeah, yeah and I it's think so it's, it's crazy to think that no matter what your stance on climate change is, it is still a perspective the downfall of the entire species, and the fact that we yeah. can't get people to care about it is is insane. Um, so yeah, that, that you know, but it's change. the same. I mean, here in, in Europe, we've got really hot, uh, abnormally hot summer weather and people are starting to, to worry about it. And you know, it's exactly the same as do you worry about the animal, the animal welfare, the one you can see suffering, or do you worry about the species? And most people are more affected by the animal suffering rather than the species going extinct. It's the same here. We get some weird weather and people think, Oh, Hey, maybe climate change matters. And then it, and then it goes away, you know, but it's the long-term trend that's going to be difficult for us. Yeah. That article specifically was talking exactly about that, about how across the world, Japan, Greece, California, even the UK now recently, the wildfires and the heat have gotten 
absolutely crazy. And obviously hurricanes are picking up and everything, but media outlets are almost uh, so unlikely to even try and link that in any way to climate change because all of a sudden half or yeah. whatever of the readership yeah, just drops off. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah. Well, it's frustrating because you, you're, it's impossible to necessarily say that this hurricane was the direct cause of climate change. But when you start exactly. seeing all of a sudden this massive amplification of the frequency of hurricanes, there's some, there's a story to be told. And, and the fact that you can't even mention that story without losing readers is a really sad reality right now. And that culture yeah. needs to change. Yeah. And I think it's, I think the, the problem that we have is that I, I spend most of my day talking to conservationists. I'm talking to you and most of the people listening are conservationists and kind of a lot of people are going to sit there and go, I know, you know, <laughs> right. everyone knows this right. is so obvious, but it's really easy to forget that it's kind of like an echo chamber. We're all talking to our group of people and there's loads of people out there that have probably never heard that before and aren't likely to read it, aren't likely to click on it. And, you know, it's really difficult. So, so I guess maybe we, we should all go to work and grab three friends and, give them a lecture. Yeah. And I think bringing it back to the trophy hunting that we started this whole conversation off by having that as a general discussion and not necessarily ostracizing people and making them feel stupid uh, if, they, if they don't know about it or don't believe in it is, is such a huge piece of that. My last yeah. question that I wanted to end off on is if you could put a billboard on the side of the highway that disseminated one message to as many Ooh. people as you possibly could, what would you throw mm. on there? Mm. That's a good one. I kind of feel gravitated towards a kind of Jurassic Park, life will always find a way kind of spookiness. I just think that would be pretty cool. Um, I like that. Uh, oh, I just, I couldn't put anything negative. Do you know what? I think I would, there's a really lovely group in the UK called Conservation Optimism. I think I'd want to put something like their logo, like a really pretty logo that just said Conservation Optimism on it. And if 1% of people went, what is that? And Googled it, I just think that'd be cool. I think this is partly the problem with conservation is you can't put a meaningful message on a billboard. You know, these these things like, hey, give two pounds a month to X, Y, Z and conservation is solved. It's just, it doesn't really get the message across. And so, yeah, maybe just something to get them thinking. Yeah, well, hopefully that's why long form podcasts will help out with that. So uh, <laughs> I appreciate you taking the time. It, it really means no a lot. Too. And I look forward to kind of staying in touch in, in your work. And For hopefully sure. we can meet up again. But I'm going to link all your work in the show notes and we can talk afterwards to make sure that I got everything in there. And other than that, I mean, keep on doing what you're doing. Um, I Thanks know so much. I, I you. at least as one individual, I'm really thankful for the work that you put in and really optimistic as well as where we're headed in this whole thing. And for listeners, exactly. thanks so much. Uh, again, please check out all the work in the show notes. And until next time, stay wild. Thank you so much for listening. I honestly cannot express how much I appreciate you taking the time for all information regarding this episode's guest, social channels, books, how you can support, etc. Please check out our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please, please, please subscribe to the podcast. We are everywhere that you can find podcasts. Subscribe to Escape the Zoo on YouTube, follow Escape the Zoo on Instagram, like Escape the Zoo on Facebook, and please share with your friends. It honestly goes so far and means so much to me. And lastly, if you'd like to be emailed with each new podcast and any other major Escape the Zoo updates, visit escapethezoo.tv and sign up for our email list. Thank you.